We have an excellent uh, panel this morning. We've been li uh, listening about uh, to uh, some of the legal issues associated with uh, with non-international armed conflict. Now we're going to get uh, the operational perspective of that, uh, uh, how those laws are applied or are not applied. Uh, from th three uh, uh, speakers uh, from the Philippines, from uh, Colombia, and from Australia. Um, first, uh, I'll, I'll introduce all three speakers very quickly, and uh, you you have their bios in your book, so I will not elaborate. Uh, but I do want to highlight uh, a few things. First, our first speaker is going to be Lieutenant General Raimundo Ferrer. Uh, he's presently the commander of uh, Western Mindanao Command, which is based in San Buaga City in the southern Philippines. Uh, but the general has commanded at all levels and uh, has had a number of uh, very important positions uh, to include the commander of uh, Eastern Mindanao Command, the 6th Infantry Division, the 1st Infantry Division, and the 103rd Infantry Brigade. So we are uh, uh, very pleased to have uh, General Ferrer with us today. Uh, our next speaker will then be uh, Colonel uh, Juan Carlos Gomez. Uh, he's uh, an active duty Colombian Air Force officer, uh, has had uh, over 2,500 hours as a combat navigator. He's also a lawyer, uh, also a graduate of the Naval Postgraduate School, and has uh, done a lot of work in human rights law and international humanitarian law, and has co-authored uh, the Colombian Ministry of Defense, so human, human Rights and International hum humanitarian law policy in 2008, as well as the first manual of operational law for the Colombian military in 2009, and uh, has served as the director of the Human Rights and International Humanitarian Law Office in the Colombian Ministry of Defense. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, Captain Rob uh, McLaughlin from Australia. Uh, Rob is currently an associate professor at the College of Law at the Australian National University. Uh, he's also a captain in the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, many of you know him, and uh, he previously was the Director of Operations and International Law uh, for the Australian uh, Defense uh, Forces uh, and has uh, served in East Timor as well as Iraq. So with that, uh, General, I will turn the mic over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am honored for being invited to speak among esteemed colleagues in the profession of arms, who, like me, are searching for answers to end conflicts in our country. Before I present the non-international armed conflicts in the Philippines, I would like to uh, remind you that I am not a lawyer. I am just a simple operator who has been fighting this conflict for the rest of my career. And I will be retiring next year, and the conflict is, uh, has no end yet. So allow me to discuss first some quick facts about my country. The Philippines is a group of 7,107 islands. If you want to buy one, we can sell it to you. <laughs> Located in Southeast Asia, between the Pacific Ocean and the South China Sea, but we want to call it now West Philippine Sea. East of Vietnam and south of Taiwan. It is the world's third largest English-speaking country. The national language is Filipino, but there are also over 100 regional dialects. The total area of the Philippines is 300,000 square kilometers, including 1,830 square kilometers of water. Population is about 92 million, and our lawmakers are still arguing whether we will pass a responsible uh, uh, health bill. The total coastline is 36,289 kilometers, and the terrain is mostly mountains with narrow to extensive coastal lowlands. There are three main island groups, namely Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Okay. There are 82% of Filipinos are Catholics as a product of uh, three centuries of Spanish colonization. 5.4% are Protestants, and around 5% are Muslims. The most troubled island, Mindanao, is where all of the Philippine threats groups can be found. This is where all of my command positions, from command of a company to battalion, brigade, division, and area command has been. I am presently the area, an area commander covering the western half of Mindanao, this side here. Many U.S. soldiers who have been deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq and other theaters of war 
who have, re have repeatedly described the Nayak in Mindanao to be particularly complex. In a place where you have strong gun culture, where local residents are part-time insurgents, and kinship ties serve as force multipliers, how do you distinguish civilians from armed insurgents? I, in this talk, I will discuss Nayak from an organizational level of analysis to provide you with the basic framework in understanding the nature of conflict in the Philippines. However, please note that on the ground, that is from the individual and operational level of analysis, it is not so neatly delineated. For example, organizational identities in southern Mindanao, unlike in the West, are highly temporal and fluid. Civilians could be recruited to work seasonally for an insurgent group and then quickly and seamlessly resume civilian life after operations are completed. Added to this complexity are the changing organizational labels civilians assume without much question. Some civilians may work for one insurgent group with an outstanding peace agreement with the government, then on the same day, join a command structure of a known terrorist group, and then very quickly, switch to supporting relatives and kin who belong to a group currently in peace negotiations with the government. Organizations in the Philippines revolve around personalities rather than positions. We in the armed forces of the Philippines strive to have interoperability among ourselves and our allies like the US, but here is our enemy where interoperability seems like second nature. Nayak in the Philippines is largely a homegrown phenomenon with some components heavily influenced by foreign elements. Conflicts rooted in ideologies outside the Philippines have been co-opted to provide a philosophical justification to a grassroots-driven insurgency. In this talk, I will primarily focus on two major Nayak facing the Philippines. I conveniently call them the two M's, the Maoist group and the Moro group. I will quickly trace their origins, describe to you some of its basic strategy and structure, and then answer any of your questions later. I will begin by comparing and contrasting these two insurgent groups, the Communist Party of the Philippines, or the CPP, and its arm wing, the New People's Army, or the NPA, uses a Maoist ideology to justify its armed struggle against the government. The CPP-NPA is considered the biggest threat in the security of the Philippines because their scope is nationwide. The Moro Group, on the other hand, limits itself within the southern Philippines. Like the CPP-NPA, it is also homegrown, a secessionist movement who has been fighting for independence for more than 100 years now, in fact, since the time of the Spanish uh, colonizers. Islamic ideology inspires its members to fight for self-determination and recognition of their ethnic identity. The Maoist and Moro groups both exploit conditions of poverty and marginalization in marshalling their armed struggle with the government. The Maoist group has a presence in the northern and eastern Mindanao, but they are strongest in the northern region of the Philippines like Luzon and the Visayas. They tend to target farmers in the rural areas, workers in mining industries, teachers, youth or students, women groups, and many other segments in the working class population vulnerable to Maoist ideology. So while the Maoist group targets people through their occupation, the Moro group, on the other hand, appeals to ethnicity and shared history in their recruitment efforts. On the CPP NPA, the communist insurgency in my country, also known as the longest running Maoist insurgency in the world, is waged by the Communist Party of the Philippines and its arm wing, the New People's Army. They are both part popularly known as the CPP NPA. In August 2002, the NPA was designated as a foreign terrorist organization by the United States and by the European Union in November 2005. The CPP NPA together with it le its legal arm, the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, which serves as the umbrella for various mass organizations, seeks to overthrow the Philippine government. The CPP was established in 1968 
as part of a larger sociological wave that was taking the world by storm. The rise of student activism in the 1960s and 1970s. However, many scholars argue that the roots of the organization could be traced all the way back to the Philippine partisan group organized during the Japanese uh, occupation in World War II. Their fighters were mobilized against Japanese occupation. Uh, however, they waged a guerrilla war against the U.S. after World War II. They were largely farmers from Central Luzon, estimated by one source to have about 15,000 to 20,000 active members and 50,000 in reserve in the early 1940s. By the early 1960s, the campaign against this group began to wane and the Sino-Soviet split at that time further fractured the group. The CPP established itself separate from the Soviet-style organization and in 1969 renamed its armed group the New People's Army with Maoist orientation. The current strength of the NPA is estimated to be around 4,200. Maoist groups believe that the power of the gun is necessary to protect ordinary citizens from human rights abuses perpetrated by the government and local politicians. Prolonged conflict or protracted struggle for the NPA would bring about the downfall of the status quo. The Philippine government would be replaced by a socialist state. The modus operandi of the NPA involves the targeting of foreign investors and businesses for extortion or what they call revolutionary taxes. The ultimate goal is to drive, to drive them out of the Philippines. NPAs also assassinate individuals such as politicians, members of the media, and other personalities they deemed as hindrances in reaching their objectives. In fact, one of the chief of the JASMAG, uh, Joint Sp U.S. Military Advisory Group, was one of those assassinated, uh, I believe, in the 80s. The general trend of the rise and fall of the CPP and PA membership coincides with the level of violence associated with each presidential administration. During the Marcos era, from 1965 to 1986, I think he has similarity with the Fujimori of Peru, there were rampant human rights abuses that fueled the rise of membership in the CPPNPA. Followers of Marx and Mao in Philippine colleges and universities formed student organizations protesting the plight of farmers in the countryside and the urban poor. In 1972, Marcos declared martial law, and for the next 13 years, under a dictatorial leadership, the CPP attracted many recruits. But the trend shifted in 1986 when Corazon Cory Aquino, the mother of our current president, Noinoy Aquino, came to power. Cory Aquino became president through the Seminal People Power Movement in 1986, largely propelled by the assassination of her husband, Ninoy Aquino, uh, in, in Manila when he arrived from Japan. During her term, ceasefire with the NPA was declared, political prisoners were released, and peace talks began. However, when the talks collapsed in 1987, the NPA returned to arms. The situation worsened when security forces violently dispersed and killed some peasants rallying for land reform, one year after Cory assumed power. Acting under the advice of the United States, Cory launched a total war against the NPA. After steady military offensives, communist forces were successfully reduced from 25,200 in 1987 to 14,800 in 1991. In fact, there are about 4,000 now. A two-pronged strategy was used that could be described in uh, current counterinsurgency parlance as hard power or military offensive and the soft power or socioeconomic development. There were also brutal purges within the Maoist group that further demoralized their rank and file. Since 11, 11 September 2001, the NPA declared an all-out war against the central government who they believe is being controlled by the United States through its global war on terror. Although the NPA most likely will not win a military victory against the government forces, their presence persists in the countryside where poverty, injustice, and the lack of social services provide conditions 
for marshalling grievance against the government. On the Moro front, the three forms of struggle. In contrast to the CPP-NPA, or the communist group, the secessionist Moro insurgency largely limits its armed struggle in the southern portion of the country where majority of Muslims Filipinos reside. Similar to the organizational pattern of the CPP-NPA, the oppressive rule of former President Marcos Martial Law in the 1970s triggered the Moro outcry against the central government who they believed to be the cause of Moro suffering. Like the CPP-NPA, the perception of marginalization drives the underlying anger fueling the Moro armed struggle. For three centuries under Spanish rule and nearly 50 years of U.S. dominance in the Philippines, the Moros were never conquered as a group. In fact, General Pershing uh, designed the caliber 45 revolver than a pistol because he could not uh, take down the Moro uh, suicide, uh, you know, suicide assassins. So that's where the caliber 45 pistol was uh, designed. However, they feel that they have to live under the Filipino Christian rule of the central government and abide by its non-Islamic way of governance. Philippine Muslim academic, academic Makapado Abaton neatly summarized six key elements in the Moro grievance, that is economic marginalization and destitution, political domination, physical insecurity, threatened Moro and Islamic identity, the perception that government is the principal culprit, the perception of hopelessness under the present setup. Marginalization of the South has always been an effective rallying cry for those who seek to manipulate moral grievance for ultimately extremist causes. The perception of hopelessness is this in the status quo is partly driving the moral justification for an armed struggle in southern Mindanao. The current president, Noinoy Aquino, however, is trusted by many Muslims and the attempt of Manila to extend various social services into the far reaches of Mindanao is slowly defeating the perception of hopelessness in many Muslim sectors in southern Philippines. These six elements of Muslim grievance has been used in one form or another in the rhetoric of many insurgent groups. There are three major Moro groups in the southern Philippines. According to the definition, we have the Moro National Liberation Front or the MNLF. Moro Islamic Liberation Front, or MILF, which span off from the MNLF, and the notorious Abu Sayyaf Group, or ASG. According to the definition in the IHL, only the MILF could truly be considered as a Nayak. The MNLF already has a peace agreement with the government, although it has not been fully implemented. The ASG lacks command and control, and in many ways, like the MNLF, no longer a formidable fighting force. The MILF remains as the largest fighting force with an agenda of carving a distinct territory in southern Philippines. The MNLF and the origins of the MILF. Around the same time the CPP NPA was formed, Nur Miswari, who was very much under the influence of Maui's ideology, founded the Moro National Liberation Front in 1972. He started an underground youth movement in Mindanao. His goal, and I quote, is to free the Muslims from the terror, oppression, and tyranny of Filipino colonialism, and to secure a free and independent state for the Bangsamoro. Bangsa means country in, uh, in the Malay language, or nation. And Moro is the collective word used to call all the, all the various Muslim ethnic groups in Mindanao. It was derived from the term Moors when Spain ruled the Philippines. Muslims in Mindanao turned this pejorative term into a badge of honor, so Bangsamoro means Moro Nation. When Nur Miswari declared jihad against the Philippine government, the MNLF led the armed resistance of all Muslims in Mindanao against martial law in 1972. The MNLF became the organizational vehicle that symbolized the Moro cause of 13 disparate Islamized ethno-linguistic groups in Mindanao. Their aim? establishment of an independent Moro nation. 
Four years of bloody war in Mindanao prompted the Organization of Islamic Conference to pressure the MNLF to accept some form of political autonomy in lieu of secession and independence. The MNLF cited the Tripoli Agreement in 1976, signed the Tripoli Agreement in 1976, but frustrations on its implementation a year later led Miswari to revert back to armed struggle. While his vice chairman, Salamat Hashim, broke away from the MNLF to establish the second Moro secessionist group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, in 1984. MILF is currently undergoing a peace process with the government of the Philippines. The MNLF and the MILF split was largely based on differences in political strategy and ideolo ideological orientation. MILF could be described as Islamic revivalist, while the MNLF is more of secular nationalist. Hashim of the MILF wanted to push for the peace process under the Tripoli Agreement and his commitment to peace negotiations remains one of the defining points of the MILF. The MNLF, however, believe in the use of force, the same armed struggle that Maoists believe is necessary in achieving peace in southern Philippines. The MILF wants to, to govern the Moro homeland under the ide ideals of Islam and Sharia law. Religion is central to the workings of the MILF. The ulama or Islamic scholars are actively involved in the leadership and internal workings of the MILF. The MNLF, on the other hand, largely concerns itself with fighting for independence. The leadership style of the MILF is consultative, where a central committee drives the organization's agenda, while the MNLF is centralized where decisions revolve around the leader, which is Nur Miswari. Additionally, the MILF is mostly dominated by the Maguindanaos Large, uh, an ethnic group largely found in central Mindanao, while the MNLF is largely composed of ethnic Tausugs, or the warrior class from the Sulu archipelago, from the islands. These two groups could not stand each other. The rise of the MILF coincided with Miswari's descent. The MNLF became increasingly fragmented in 1982 and when the MNLF signed the final peace agreement with the government of the Philippines in 1996, the MNLF ceased to become a formidable fighting force. The MILF today. The MILF is the largest Muslim guerrilla group today and the most po potent security threat in Mindanao. The organization has about 12,000 members and its main base is in central Mindanao with presence in the islands of Basilan and other islands in the Sulu Archipelago and Palawan. While the MILF is currently engaged in what many describe as an on and off peace negotiation with the government since 1997, there are several what we call lost commands no, or loose or, uh, groups that engage government forces in armed conflicts. The latest major conflict was in 2008 when the government of the Philippines initiated initial the Memorandum of Agreement on the Ancestral Domain, or the MOA AD, that gives the MILF its own distinct territory with a governing body called the Bangsamoro Juridical Entity. However, before the formal signing was finalized, certain non-Muslim leaders in central Mindanao got hold of a copy of the embargoed MOA and went on a campaign to dissolve the agreement. Part of the distinct territory mentioned in the MOA AD included areas that were never under Muslim leadership. The non-Muslim groups managed to put enough political pressure to prompt the Supreme Court to issue a temporary restraining order. When the signing ceremony of the MOA AD, supposed to be in Malaysia, was aborted, MILF renegade commanders went on a, ra on a rampage and attacked civilian villages in northern and central Mindanao. Hundreds died in about uh, 390,000 people, in fact more than that probably, were displaced due to what would be considered a NIAC. The Supreme Court eventually declared the MOA to be unconstitutional and government forces went after the three renegade MILF commanders after we lifted the ceasefire. One of those commanders, a certain uh, Amiril Umbracato, uh, soon he will be famous, who broke away from the MILF recently, 
spoke of taking up arms if the current government and MILF peace process for, fails again or become endlessly delayed. To date, about 120,000 people have, have been killed and 2 million people displaced from their homes over MILF-led encounters with government forces. The MILF leaders have put, in, have put in significant effort in bringing in international audience into its peace negotiations. The international monitoring team, composed of representatives from Malaysia, Brunei, Libya, Japan, Norway, and European Union, oversee the ceasefire agree agreement between the MILF and the government of the Philippines. Over more than, more than 70 agreements have been reached between the MILF and the Philippine government since 1997, but more of more, these agreements uh, concern security guarantees and uh, development uh, efforts. One more group that remains without any form of ceasefire agreement with the government and is not considered by the ICRC as a NIAC is the Abu Sayyaf group. However, I will quickly discuss the group because they do have tactical alliances with the MILF, and in its early years, one could argue that it could be considered an IAC. On the Abu Sayyaf, the inspiration of the Al-Qaeda-linked Abu Sayyaf group came from radical Islamism, notably the jihad against Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Around the time that the MNLF was engaged in peace negotiations with the Philippine government in the late 80s and 90s, an underground movement of disenchanted youth began to be mobilized by a charismatic preacher in Basilan named Abdurajak Abu Bakar Janjalani. Janjalani wanted an independent state for the Muslims in Mindanao. Academics continued to debate whether Janjalani in fact fought during the Afghanistan war. But regardless whether he did or not, the primary driving force behind ASG's formation is rooted in a jihadist war that the MNLF failed to follow through according to the perception of many idealistic Muslim youth. The disenchanted Muslim youths felt that the older cadres abandoned the spirit of the Bangsamoros struggle against the government in the 1970s. They felt that the MNLF leaders betrayed their cause and acquiesced to the Philippine government when it entered into peace negotiations. Jan Jalani formally founded the ASG in 1992 and justified his jihad based on the following arguments. The Philippine government, with the help of its Christian allies, notably the U.S., severely oppressed the Bangsamoro people. This oppression came about by the unwelcome intrusion of Christians into the Muslim hom homeland. To defeat this oppression, the struggle for the cause of Allah must be waged against the Christian invaders. It is the personal obligation of every Muslim to carry out this jihad and failure to do so would be a sin against Allah. So as you can see, Many of the ideals espoused by the group overlaps with the MILF, and thus the movement of members from these groups tend to be seamless. Many are also related through blood ties. In fact, some of the orphans of the MNLF war are also now the Abu Sayyaf. The Abu Sayyaf group, driven by its secessionist and extreme Islamic ideology, became internationalized with the involvement of the Jema'a Islamiyah, a regional-based terrorist group. Uh, operating in Malaysia and Indonesia, whose goal is to establish a Muslim caliphate throughout South Southeast Asia. However, with the death of Janjalani and the demise of several key ASG leaders, ASG's jihadist ideological fervor has died down, particularly among the rank and file. Many argue that the ASG has now degraded into criminality. While the old timers remain loyal to the cause, the financial pressures, lack of loyalty among the rank and file, and the U.S.-backed military offensives against the Abu Sayyaf group has degraded the once notorious Moro fighters into a bunch of thugs. Conclusion. There are now two parallel peace tracks currently underway in connection with NIACs in the, in the Philippines. The peace negotiations with the CPP and PA and peace negotiations with the MILF. Localized conflicts these days have become increasingly intertwined with the social values of a larger international audience, bringing about the downfall of institutions and governments. Small grassroots movements and extremist cells throughout the world have capitalized on social media networks 
to gain sympathy in an, from an international audience, all too willing to impose their moral values and judgments on the illegitimacy of armed conflicts. In the case of the Philippines, one could argue that these two Nayaks with long roots from the past remain outside the reach of an increasingly globalized world where the hearts and minds of the people simply refuse to let go of the past. And yet, there is hope for the future generation where the fatigue of war and the rhetoric of grievance no longer inspire the same intense anger. In my experience working with various communities in Mindanao, promoting peace as another way to defeat the enemy, I have learned that people will behave according to the way you view them. If you treat them as an enemy, then they will become one. If you treat them as partners, then they will respond in kind. Non-international armed conflicts in the Philippines with all its complexities could be viewed simply as a cry for human security. The need to have a dignified way of life where the basic necessities of survival become a fundamental right for each and every individual. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you, General. Our, uh Next speaker will be uh, uh, Colonel Juan Carlos Gomez from uh, the Colombian Armed Forces. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me as a human being, as a Colombian, as a member of the military forces, to be here chairing in the Neighbor War, War College some of the experience that I have had during my career, during these 27 years as an officer, as an officer in the Air Force, and in a country that has been for 45 years in an internal conflict. So I, I will not talk about the background of, of Colombia, but I will emphasize about the last almost 20 to 30 years that I think too many important things have happened during this period. At the end of the 20th century, we had a very violent decade in where the government that we had between 1996, 1992 and 1998, and between 1998 and 2002, we're trying to get peace for our country through a peace process. But rather to get a, a peace for our country, what we had what, uh, was an increase of violence. And so in 2002, Colombians made the decision to change the situation and Colombia gave the opportunity to a new government to fight against the armed actors and the situation in Colombia changed dramatically between 2002 and today. So I will make emphasis in this period and I will let you know in the operational sense and also in legal sense what this uh, mean for, for us in the military force. So here in this slide you can see the kind of crimes that we suffer during the, the period that I told you. This first, first picture is an, a, a bomb that <coughs> the guerrilla put in, in, in the in a city pretty close to the runway in the airport. They were trying to kill the, the president, Uribe. They couldn't, but they killed too many civilians. This is a, a bomb, 
in a club in Bogota, killed more than 37 people. This is a, a main source of transportation in Colombia. This is a bridge, this is a road bomb, and they attack all the infrastructure in our country during that time. These are the pipelines. Every day they bump pipelines and they destroy the, the environment. So that was the situation in, until 2002. These are the actors, <coughs> or were the actors here. The Revolutionary Army, Revolutionary Armed Force of Colombia, the FARC. It had, at that time, more than 6,000 children. And these are the ELN, or the National Liberation Army. And here we, we see the, the stream right that we call the illegal self-defense or the paramilitary. So during the Uribe's period, so he was two terms in the government, so he was from 2002 till 2006, and since 2006 to 2010. So he had a peace process with the paramilitary. He de demobilized more than 40,000 people. Uh, the, the FARC was defeated in many places in our country, and in other places was weakened as well as the ELN they had in 2002, about 5,000 people. Now they have less than 1,500, the FARC. I think that today they have less than 8,000 people. And even though the paramilitary forces demobilize, there are still around about 5,000 people that we call nowadays um, the criminal bands who are working especially in the business of narco-trafficking and illegal mining. And here I want to emphasize some of the heads of this organization. This one, this one was killed last year. This was the, the commander-in-chief of the FARC, Mono Hohoi. Thank God he's not around anymore. Okay, but unfortunately, even though the, the success that we already had, we still have too many problems going on. And these are the kind of problems that we are facing today. But these problems are not only problems of Colombia. These problems are problems of Colombia, Central America, and even are affecting Mexico. And I remember pretty well a meeting that, that we had in 2006 where we were planning an, a special strategy that we call like the, the, the strategic jump. So in that, in that meeting, the, the director of the police said, and I remember pretty well what he said, talking about the, the war against narco-trafficking. War, war against drugs, and he said, okay, if we succeed, we have two possibilities. One, to, if the consumption continue, what we will have is these two possibilities. One, to increase the price of the, of the production, the transportation, and the distribution, and second, this problem will move to another place. The balloon effect will be in place. And he was absolutely right. So we succeed in Colombia in the sense that we today have more or less, uh, much less narco-trafficking than we had before. But what we are seeing today is that this problem moved again to Peru, again to Bolivia, and so to the countries in Central America and into Mexico. <clears throat>
So, <clears throat> as I told you, these are the crimes that we in the military forces and the police are facing today. When we start this fight in 2002, the Colombian military forces and the police were in total about 300,000 people. Now we are 450,000 people. And when I talk in total, what I'm trying to say is that the police and the military forces in my country are under the same umbrella, under the Ministry of Defense. So this problem is a task of the military forces, and that is a problem of the police also. And, and I will try to explain why it's important for me to tell you this. Being a lawyer and trying to advise commanders about what to do to deal with the problem that we are facing, what I realize is that we only have two sets of norms to deal with this problem. One is the human rights set of laws, and the other one is the international humanitarian law set of laws. And they are very different in the sense that you will know that human rights is a law of maximums in the sense that you have to protect population. And meanwhile, international humanitarian law is a law of minimums. So the legislator here knows that you are facing a problem as a state, as an organization, and what the legislator is trying to do is to give you the tools to deal with this problem. So he knows that you will create damage, that, will, that you will destroy property. So what the legislator is asking is to reduce the damage, to cause the less damage you can, to kill the less people you can. So in that sense, it's very different, this law, from this one. But what is the problem? The problem is that the crimes and the terrorism is like in the middle of these two laws. And in the case of Colombia, we don't have any special law to deal with this problem. Because the, the only law that we have is the human rights law and the international humanitarian law. We don't have any special statute like you have here in the United States and some other countries in Europe to deal with this problem. But if you see this special law, they don't give you many possibilities to deal with the crime organizations or with terrorism. So I try to, to show here in this slide the two different laws, so human rights, in this ellipse, and international humanitarian law in the other one. And what we have in the core are those rights that independently, if you are here or there, you have to respect. And those are life, liberty, not torture, nor, not slavery. And you have, if you, if you are facing trail, you have to have a fair trail. So, the United States, Canada, and almost all the countries in, in the Western Hemisphere just apply this law. Because if you are not in a conflict, in an internal conflict or an international conflict, you don't have to use international humanitarian law. Okay. This is what happened in Colombia in 2002. What I'm trying to show here is how these two norms apply at that moment. So it's not literally like this, but because the, the, the threat that we were facing, we apply international humanitarian law, like in the 50% of the territory and human rights in the other part. 
At that time, I want to tell you that it was almost impossible to travel. Bogotá, that is the capital, is here. And this is the coast. Here is Cartagena, Barranquilla, and Santa Marta. The distance between Bogotá and Cartagena is about 600 miles. So it was impossible at that time to travel by car to that place because the possibility of being kidnapped. Even if you were in Cartagena, you couldn't go two miles to the south outside the city. We had to close the roads after six o'clock in the afternoon until six o'clock in the morning because the possibility of being kidnapped. The same for us as a military in our bases. We, had, we have two bases, one two hours from Bogota and the other one another two hours in the other side of the of the mountain, it was impossible to travel to Bogota by car. You have to wait. You had to wait at the time, a plane to fly. It was ridiculous. It was really, really sad situation that we were confronting. After all the success that we had during the last 10 years, now what we are seeing in our country is this. We apply human rights in almost the whole country and international humanitarian law, we still apply, but just in, in a few places. So this is what is happening, in my view. So this ellipse is eclipsing the international humanitarian law ellipse. So what we are expecting is that in the short future, we will not apply international humanitarian law inside the country anymore. So that is very nice. But you being a military officer or a soldier, that is very difficult to apply and to understand. And this graphic, what I'm trying to show in this graphic is what happened in Colombia. Here, we, we were here in 2002. We apply as a military international humanitarian law. It was pretty clear for us. And little by little, without noticing, we were, we were moving to this side. And here, we got this gray sun. There is not a line. This is a gray sun. And this got a legal cost. Today, we got more than 2,007 criminal investigations against military members, many of them because extrajudicial killings. We got right now 1,300 members of the military forces under this criminal investigation. Many, many of them are already condemned to sentences from 60 to 40 years in jail. And, and what I realized is that we didn't see when we jumped from this side to this side. And look, just talk a little bit about the proportionality principle. Because in both sides we, we see the principle. But here, and you, those of you who are lawyers, know pretty well the difference of this proportionality with this one. Here, you know that if you need to use the force, this force has to be proportional to, the, to, to confront the, the force that are, of somebody is using against you. So if somebody insults you, you can't use your pistol to react against this, this attack. But here, proportionality is very different. The meaning of proportionality here is that the, the damage, and this is the definition, the damage that I produce has to be proportional to the military, to the military advantage that, I've, that I obtain when I attack something. So in this, in this side, I already know the legislator knew that, yes, I will create damage, I will kill people. So he is asking me to reduce the damage, to reduce the collateral damage. 
So in that sense, it's very different when you are acting here than in here. So what are we doing right now to try to, to confront this reality? We, with your support, because we have learned a lot from the United States about this issue of, human, of rule of engagement, what we are doing right now is trying to, to apply a set of rules of engagement that we divide like this. A human rights set of rule of, en uh, rule of engagement and international humanitarian law rule of engagement. And we d use colors. So when we, when we send soldiers to a military operation, in the planning process, we already know if this operation will be in the human rights arena or in the international humanitarian law arena. And to make easy the decision for soldiers, we use these two colors. So when, when a Colombian soldier today is dealing with a police problem, he got his blue card. And he knows that the only possibility for him to use force is in self-defense. That's his only possibility. But if he's using the red car, he knows that he can use lethal force as a first option because he is in combat and he's facing a military objective. Believe me, it's easier to explain that here than to use that in the, in the battlefield. It, it is not easy, but with this, we have improved our situation, we are defending our legitimacy, and we are having less problems than we had before. And what concepts are we using today to get to that conclusion? And we are using this person that I'm positive you know pretty well, General Rupert Smith, who got a book that is called The Utility of Force. And he says that now wars are in the middle of population. We are not anymore talking about industrial wars. No, he said, now almost all the wars are in the middle of population. And we got three actors here. One actor is the state or the government. The other actor is the police or in the case of Colombia and many countries in Latin America and in other parts of the world that are facing the threats that we have today, they are using military forces. And the third actor are criminals. And for criminals, the center of gravity for these criminal actors is population. They live inside the population, they use the population, they need the population to survive. And we, as a state or as a military actors or as a police, our legitimacy, that is our center of gravity, depends from population. So the battlefield today is the population. So nobody like these guys. Nobody. But if we, as a state or as a military force, forces, make many mistakes trying to defeat or neutralize these criminals, we will have all this population against us. So we can win all the battles and still lose the war. And you know this pretty well. Today, threats. And, and in this slide, I want you to, to think about Afghanistan, about Iraq, and about Mexico and these countries in Central America, and, and try to identify what I will try to identify talking about the criminals in Colombia today. I think that criminals in Colombia today have little to lose. So if you attack them in one place, and you, if you defeat them in one place, 
they move to another place without any problem. They don't have territory to defend because they work in the middle of population. So they move pretty easy. Survive in the middle of the population and use them. And if you are in a state, and that is happening in Colombia with the, the, the guerrilla groups that we have today. Because when I see all the, the, the heads of the organization, the commanders, almost all of them get criminal cases. Many of them are already condemned. And the crimes that they commit, these crimes you can't have an amnesty. So it is impossible to negotiate with them. The only possibility is to confront them, to weaken them, and to prosecute them. What can we do? So, and, and this is part of the experience that, that I bring from Colombia. We create something that we call an observatory of crime. So we, in each place, identify what was the crime, the main crime, or what were the main crimes. And then we plan an action to do, and this plan incorporate not only the government, not only the military forces, not only the police. It, this plan includes the whole society. As a lawyer, we have a lot of work because today, military commanders, they don't want to go to, to the service without the legal advice, without the rule of engagement. After action review, uh, maybe two or three months ago, I, I, I had the opportunity to be in a meeting with uh, the U.S. Air Force, and, and I learned that, at least in the Air Force, and I think the Navy is the same, you got after action review as a, as a part of the structure of the organization. So, so, so we are trying to do the same. So not just uh, something to do, but if you got this uh, as a part of the structure, it's something that is very good. The truth of it all. So we have learned that history can forgive you for a mistake. And people can forgive you, the population can forgive you if you make a mistake, but they will never forgive a lie or a partial truth. So you always have to, to tell the truth when you are a commander or if you are a lawyer dealing with the problems that we are facing today. We can't avoid any situation. We have to, to investigate all the situations and, and also, and, and this is something that we learned from our former president, and, and that is that if the population asks you to go to some place because they think something is wrong, and if you go there and you do not find something, and they call you 10 times, you have to go 10 times, or even 11. Because if you don't go and something happens, they will not trust you again. So this is something very important. And, and something that you know pretty well, now, now we, we talk about the strategic sergeant, the strategic lieutenant and captain, because the important things are happening at the tactical level, and they have an a strategic effect. Okay, last remarks. We know pretty well legitimacy is our center of, gravi of gravity and, and, and this is the most important thing. You can't lose your legitimacy. Today, we are suffering in Colombia the consequences of this 1,300 cases that I told you. And even though the, the success that we have had, this has been very hard for us to, to deal with.
I know it's, it's not the case here in the States, but if you see the countries, starting from Mexico, going down Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and going to South America, Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, all these countries are using the military forces to deal with the problems that we are facing today. And what I want to, to, to present here, and, and, I, and I want to be a little bit provocative with this idea, is that in the graphic that I show you, in where we were passing from international humanitarian law to a human rights, I think that it could be in the other side. So maybe you could be in embodiment of human rights, but little by little you can move to international humanitarian law. Of course, that depends of the will of the government and it has to do with constitution and law and too many other things, but that could be a possibility. Population is key, you have to protect them. So, talking about the FARC again, again, I think that today we have more or less 8,000 people inside the organization but they get, for each um, soldier, I, I said, or for one combatant, they have three civilians who support them. So we cannot consider them as enemies. Just in the case that they participate directly in hostilities, okay, we can consider them as a military objective, but if not, they are civilians. And the only, the only possibility that we have to deal with them is through the court. This is what I just said. We, can, we have to consider the possibility to use international humanitarian law. It is a tool. It is a tool that gives us some opportunity to act against the new threat, and we can avoid that. And as I said, you can win all the battles, but still lose the war. Okay, I, I wanted to, to end with uh, a statement that says that you can't change the, the, direction, of, the direction of the win but you can adjust your sales to get to the point you want to go. And in and, and saying this, I think that the legal environment that we are facing today is what we have. We can't change it. But we have, as a military members, we have to accomplish the mission. And as a lawyer, we have to give advices to our commanders to accomplish the mission. And I think that even though the difficulties and the complexity of the environment, there are still tools that we can use to succeed in this, in this fight. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Gomez. Um, we, uh, we have a hard 9.30 uh, coffee break period. Um, Rob, I don't think you're going to be able to finish in 20 minutes. Um, Dennis, what would you, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to uh, uh, extend the break or? Okay. Um, is that okay? You want to start? Or, or okay. Oh, good morning, all, and. Uh, can I just say it's an honor to be here and it's a privilege uh, to be on this very distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to just add my congratulations to Mike, but also very importantly to, uh, to thank Dennis. I've had a long, uh, a long experience with Dennis and even though he continues to fail in the most basic uh, ability to spell certain English words such as defence, practice, licence. Um, and despite his usual comeback, which is when he's wrong legally, his answer is he's right because 12 carrier battle groups and 100,000 Marines said so. Other than that, Dennis, it's been a privilege to work with you. <laughs>
my aim today is to talk about, uh, in a very similar vein, to talk about an Austra the Australian perspective, if there is such a thing, uh, on some of the issues that the moderator set for us in terms of NIAC. I'd like to do so by using a comparison between a high-end non-NIAC operation, East Timor, and a NIAC operation, which is Afghanistan. And the reason I want to do that is because the characterisation decisions we make at the very start have very significant spin-offs, particularly in terms of ROE, and, and, and the last speaker just talked about that. And also because they represent a, an important trade-off between the political strategic context and the tactical needs. Often these are the two sides you have to balance up when we're making these characterisation decisions. But the important point is they reflect that balance as equally as they reflect the law. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little while. So Australia has been a belligerent in three international armed conflicts in, last, uh, in the last um, couple of decades. Gulf I, Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003. We've been a belligerent in two NIACs in that period, Afghanistan since 2005 and Iraq in the later 2000s. But Australia's been a non-belligerent within NIACs in many more instances than that, at least seven. Rwanda, Somalia, Cambodia, East Timor in, uh, in the early part of uh, 2000 uh, and several others. And this is an important dividing line or watershed for the Australian approach, if there is such a thing, to NIAC and to determining characterisation decisions. Now, why is the characterisation decision, this initial decision about what it is so important? Well, because unlike a number of other countries, and really the last speaker hit this right on the head, we have to decide what we characterise the conflict as because that dictates what force we can use. If it is a law enforcement operation, and I'll get to this when we talk about ROE, then our ability to use lethal force is cut off at the point of self-defence. And I'm talking individual or unit self-defence, not national self-defence. So the ability to use lethal force ends at individual slant unit self-defence. When there is a NIAC and we are a belligerent within that NIAC, the ability to use lethal force then steps across a line and becomes governed by the LOAC principles, as well as the continuing existence of the self-defence rules. So the points in comparison, just to explain why I've chosen those two. I'll use East Timor as one because it's the largest Australian deployment since Vietnam and there is a debate as to whether it was a NIAC. Now, I'll leave that aside for the moment and just explain that uh, later on in questions, for example. Afghanistan is clearly a NIAC and is Australia's other major commitment uh, in the last uh, decade. The characterisation of conflict, the first and most seminal point. Well, Afghanistan, since Australia re-engaged in 2005, is clearly a NIAC. No one debates that. And Australia is clearly a belligerent within that NIAC. East Timor in 1999-2001, however, was consciously characterised as a law enforcement operation, not as a NIAC. Now, the issue of whether it was a NIAC or even an IAC was consciously considered and a decision was made to go with a law enforcement operation. Now, what was different? Contextually, you'd say that very, very many similarities between the situations. The facts on the ground we're not radically different. That is the jurisdictional facts, the facts that tell us which way to go at this lower threshold of low act or less than low act law, uh, law enforcement operations. Proportionally, there are high degrees of, uh, of casualties. I won't talk about Afghanistan. That is sort of knowledge in the public domain. But in East Timor, tens of thousands had died in an insurgency since 1975. And at the point of intervention, when uh, Interfet went in, in in September 99, uh, all Dili was completely, uh, was substantially uh, destroyed. Uh, all but three of the major towns in East Timor had been completely destroyed or uh, are rated at 70 cent complete destruction. There was no basic infrastructure and all the other uh, conditions of, of, a, of the state had, had collapsed. And a preliminary UN uh, assessment was that of a population of 890,000 in East Timor, over 500,000 had been displaced by the violence and at least 150,000 of those had been displaced into West Timor, which was Indonesian territory. So the intensity, if you're using the Tadic, uh, the Tadic uh, criteria, there's clearly intensity. And then organisation. Well, there were legacy militias there from the independence days, uh, but also there was a new militia, an independent, uh, a uh, pro-integrationist militia, and I'll talk about how they were sponsored and what 
that meant for their characterization in a moment. So clearly there was an organizational limb as well. So you could say that contextually Afghanistan and, uh, and East Timor in many ways similar. But it was the strategic context of each of them which led to different conflict characterization decisions. In Afghanistan it was easy. The other was the unloved Taliban and the universally detested Al-Qaeda. They were both described in militarised rhetoric, emphasising organisation, capacity, universal aims, threat level and the such. And in, do in, in announcing the deployment of forces to Afghanistan, our Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, said he, he was very explicit as, the, as to the condemnable nature of the other. And he said, well, we certainly don't have any concern about being involved in action against these people who were responsible for the terrorist attack, referring, of course, to 11 September. And indeed, Australia had invoked ANZUS, which was our uh, equivalent of the NATO treaty with the US and, and New Zealand, which clearly put the whole context into a militarised law, uh, uh, law of armed conflict context. So in relation to Afghanistan, engaging as a belligerent and naik was, was strategically and politically uh, almost no risk in terms of who, are you going, uh, who your uh, strategic neighbours are and the achievement, the strategic risk that goes against uh, deciding that you're a belligerent in a NIAC. But the context in East Timor, the characterisation context, was very different. Certainly there'd been arguably a NIAC, potentially even an IAC, uh, during the Indonesian occupation period and, and certainly once the militias went on a rampage after the ballot in 1999. May have even been an Article 1, uh, sorry, an AP1, Article 1, 4 conflict. But for Australia, this was a very difficult issue because Australia is one of the few countries which had recognised the Indonesian annexation of East Timor, recognised it in 1976. And so when Australia went in, and it wasn't just Australia, the Interfet Force, it was commanded by Australia, it was a Green Helmet Force, so a UN authorised but not a Blue Helmet UN Force. Australia therefore, with the UN, had a scope to characterise the decision, uh, characterise the conflict. And a decision was made that it was not a NIAC. We would not be a belligerent in a NIAC. And even though the pro-integrationist militias were uh, burning, looting, killing and terrorising, and were doing so with the tacit support, uh, if not even greater support, of, of elements of the Indonesian military, the decision was made to characterise this as a law enforcement operation, not as a NIAC. And the Foreign Minister at the time said, we've made the point that there are clearly links between members of the Indonesian military and the militia, and that matter's no longer debated. Now, they, these, this militia was certainly, when you look at it in today's terms, characterisable, perhaps, as an OAG in NIAC. But the thing is, that debate hadn't yet happened. This is in 1999-2000. And when we turned to look at how to describe an OAG, an organised armed group, we were really falling back on the old black letter law. For, we, we could draw from AP2 and AP1 and Common Article 3, as opposed to the debate we've had since uh, the Red Cross process, the ICRC process kicked off, we're now at a much more refined position as to understanding what it is that an organised armed group is. So that's a first uh, and very interesting point, but it's a chronological point. There are also other vital factors in the strategic context which led, led us to decide that this was a law enforcement operation as opposed to a NIAC operation. First, the force was there at the invitation of Indonesia, which makes it very difficult to then say that you're in a NIAC against uh, Indonesian sponsored or Indonesian uh, supported militia groups. The second is, we're actually supposed to share responsibility for security with Indonesian forces. So regardless of whether there was a NIAC afoot, a NIAC afoot the UN Security Council had decided, uh, and Australia had agreed, that this was a law enforcement operation and that there were no belligerents, certainly on our side, in the operation. So regardless of the actual context, if you apply the black letter law rules, there is a political and strategic element in the context characterisation, and this was an important point. This also flows through into characterisation of the other, and I'll talk about that uh, now. In many ways, this issue of characterisation of the other flows absolutely from the characterisation of the conflict as a whole. In Afghanistan, where Australia is a belligerent in a NIAC, the other is defined clearly in terms of an OAG. This is all about uh, the concepts of, of uh, organisation and command. But the interesting thing is, as we work out what an organised armed group is, we've had to apply it at the same time. This is, I think, I can't remember another occasion where we've had to do this, but as the consequence, 
we've been working at the parameters of this organised armed group concept at the same time as we're using it to justify lethal effects in a NIAC, which itself is quite an interesting conundrum to be in when you're, when you're dealing with a, a, a non-international armed conflict. This is also critical for a, another reason. And as while Australia's been working out what an organised armed group means in a NIAC, all of the other partners in ISAF have been doing the same. And not all of them come up with the same solution. Now, why is that important? Well, I'll give you two examples. The first, the targeting of drug barons for you all. I'll say no more. You can trace that debate through the pages of your main uh, national daily newspapers. The second is third country deployed personnel. So an Australian soldier who is deployed with uh, a British regiment, for example. Why is that important? Well, when we sent Australian gunners, artillerymen, to join a UK artillery regiment in Afghanistan, it was really important for us to actually sit down with the UK and work out, well, what is the envelope of your OAG understanding and how does it look beside our envelope of OAG? Why? Because if, the, if there's a difference, if one is smaller, if one envelope is smaller than the other, then in that grey area between where our envelope ends and the UK envelope ends, if the gunner takes on a target in that grey area, they may be committing an offence against Australian criminal law. And so that's why working out where all the other states are at, your interoperating partners are at in the terms of developing this concept is so vital. Now in East Timor, we went into a law enforcement operation. There was no issue with characterising the other in terms of an OAG. The Law Act didn't apply. And the other was clearly, clearly uh, described in criminal terms. And in fact, at the time, it was the, the, the language used was described bullying, thugs, uh, bad behaviour and transience. To talk about ROE issues. Now, the fact that East Timor was characterised as less than NIAC law enforcement, whereas Afghanistan is NIAC, holds significant consequences for ROE. And I just want to give you some concrete examples. For NIAC related ROE, I'll give you four, and these are four issues Australia has faced. First, as noted previously, when you've got third country deployment, uh, third country deployed members, you've got to know what the other country's uh, envelope of the OAG is because you've got to be able to advise your people which envelope they can use. Second, a complication of the fact is that when Australia went in as a belligerent into a NATO or ISAF force in Afghanistan, we had to draft our ROE with a very clear eye on the NATO ROE. This caused some initial uh, issues because we had to nationalise the NATO ROE so we could understand what it meant. And in, two, in, in relation to two concepts, hostile act and hostile intent, the NATO ROE uses them in a completely different way, uses them, well, as we understand it anyway, uses them in terms of attack rules, whereas hostile act, hostile intent in the Australian context are purely about self-defence. And they are really just military shorthand for the concepts of necessity and immediacy in criminal law self-defence. And so in order, we had to deconflict that and explain that to our troops and make sure that was reflected in our ROE. The third thing is that when Australia signs up to a NIAC, it means we have to apply a whole range of more stringent rules uh, to many enabling capacities. So for a NIAC, it really matters precisely what the contractor is doing in terms of the UAV and who's watching over what is going on. Whereas in a law enforcement operation, it really doesn't matter that much who is controlling the UAV. Finally, and I think this is an interesting ROE issue, which you see being played out in uh, civilian casualty inquiries and reports, and that is that there's a great deal of fluidity and uncertainty surrounding the characterisation of the status of the person who the digger or the soldier just shot. A and this has meant that assertions of justification are often double-barrelled, and I'll explain what I mean. An Australian force member, when explaining why they shot someone, may well say that they shot them in self-defence because I thought he was going to shoot me, so I shot him, and that they shot them because they believed them to be a member of the organised armed group and therefore a lawful target. Now this, this issue rarely arises, uh, arises in IAC. In, in IAC, it's quite simple. I shot that guy over there because he's in the enemy's uniform and he's the enemy. But in a NIAC, this is actually a, 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 major, a major issue. For example, there's one report, and this one is, on, uh, is publicly available, uh, into a CIVCAS incident on the 2nd of April 
2009, where the Australian Force uh, identified that a, a OAG leader, an organised armed group leader, was holed up in a compound. Uh, during the clearance process when they went in, they shot and killed a number of men who uh, they believed to be in firing positions and directly participating in hostilities. And yet the pinpoint explanation that each of the shooters gave was self-defence. I shot them because I thought they were going to shoot me. Is this even important? Well, actually, yes, it is, because and the last speaker made this point very, very uh, eloquently. In Australian criminal law, the requirements, uh, the, the standards of assessment for a killing in self-defence is very different from the standard of assessment for a killing in accordance with the law of armed conflict, that is, a member of, of an organised armed group. And proportionality is precisely the example where this comes out most clearly. In East Timor, the decision to characterise the conflict as less than NIAC law enforcement created a different set of ROE problems. And I'll explain those and then I'll, I'll, I'll end. Yep, we'll stop there. Let's go ahead and take our break now and, uh, and then we'll come back and Rob, if you'll finish up and then we'll take Q&A. Thank Not you. No problem. So uh, we have a little extra time on our hands, so it'll be plenty of time for Q&A. Thanks, Pete. Um, just before we went to the break, I, I talked about four ROE challenges that are incumbent upon deciding to characterise a conflict as NIAC. And I guess to draw the comparison again, uh, I'll talk about four ROE challenges that flowed from deciding to characterise East Timor as a law enforcement, a less than NIAC law enforcement operation. The first and most significant is the way that ROE explains use of force options uh, as distinct between self-defence and mission accomplishment. And if you're in a law enforcement operation, certainly for Australia at any rate, your mission accomplishment ROE can only go up to but not including lethal force because lethal force is preserved for self-defence in a law enforcement operation, not for mission accomplishment. And this was an interesting conundrum because the Interfed ROE, uh, a United Nations ROE, based in around the United Nations uh, ROE um, system, upon entry into East Timor, contained a rule authorising the use of force, including lethal force, for mission accomplishment. Now, in a NIAC, that ROE is the norm because from your use of lethal force for mission accomplishment rule, that's your general overriding rule, and then you have a series of discrete rules thereafter to tell you how you do that in terms of status and identification and targeting, etc. But in law enforcement, uh, Australian criminal law certainly does not allow for use of lethal force in anything that you would approximate to mission accomplishment. It is for self-defence, individual or unit self-defence alone, not for mission accomplishment. You can use force in mission accomplishment, you can use force to detain, you can break open doors and things like that, but not lethal force. And so it was an interesting conundrum in that the UNROE was issued, the main troop contributing nation and the commander, being Australian, then had to uh, issue a, a, uh, a commander's view on the ROE which effectively read it down to the way we understood the ROE, so not lethal force for mission accomplishment. But the other thing that this threw up, this is the second point, is what does it mean when you have a UN Security Council, Chapter 7, All Necessary Means Resolution or Authorisation, and you're not in a NIAC context, so you're in a law enforcement context, does that authorisation provide a, a separate paradigm for the use of lethal force in mission accomplishment, where self-defence is not in play? This is a really quite a complicated question, and I have a view, it's a contested view, but um, my view is there's no such thing as a third paradigm. It's either law enforcement self-defence or it's an armed conflict. There's no thing in the middle where it's not an IAC but the UN Security Council has said in accordance with the Chapter 7 resolution authorising all necessary means that you can do X, Y and Z. That is not a ticket to use lethal force outside of a NIAC other than in self-defence as we understand it in criminal law. Another problem was that on transition to UNTAYET, the follow-on UN force, um, the UNROE actually in my view became even more opaque and I'll read you an excerpt from it. The April 2000 ROE, and this is publicly available by the way, um, UNTAYAT un military personnel are required to comply with international law, including the law of armed conflict, I'm not sure, uh, and to apply the ROE in accordance with those laws. 
The ROE then detailed a series of level of force uh, rules, which permitted use of lethal force in self-defence, as you would expect, but then also in a series of what m many of us would actually characterise as mission accomplishment tasks. For example, use of lethal force against any party who limits or intends to limit untayet freedom of movement, use of lethal force against any armed party who attempts to prevent untayet personnel from discharging their duty. So in the Australian context, those sorts of tasks, those sorts of uh, things are related to mission accomplishment as opposed to individual or unit self-defence. So given that the Australian characterisation was as a less than uh, NIAC law enforcement operation, had to read down those rules as well. The fourth issue is, uh, and I think this, this was also referred to by the previous speaker, in East Timor, the, the, the consequence of deciding that you're in a law enforcement operation as opposed to a NIAC operation is that your, uh, what throws its head up very quickly is force protection. When the, when the strategic or tactical circumstances change and force protection becomes more of an issue, you're actually in a much more limited area uh, in terms of freedom of manoeuvre. In, East, in the East Timor context, this occurred after the initial interfed operation, Untayet has settled in, and then the militia started to recommence attacks across the border uh, from West Timor where they found sanctuary, and they came across the border and killed a number of members of the peacekeeping force and then would retreat back into West Timor. But there wasn't a NIAC, so there's no availability of LOAC rules to deal with the threat. And so to deal with the threat, the way it was done, was that we had to provide an expanded definition of hostile act and hostile intent, which, remember, are about self-defence in that individual self-defence criminal law uh, uh, way. And so by expanding hostile act, hostile intent to um, cover armed militia moving in a tactical manner, that this, therefore, was enough to trigger the right of self-defence. So this is an interesting conundrum that you face in the force protection field when you've decided to go down a, a non, a less than NIAC law enforcement route uh, as opposed to a NIAC route. Now the final main area to talk about is uh, the treatment of captured and detained personnel. And in this field actually I think there is almost zero difference between the way uh, that we approach the issue in a less than NIAC law enforcement operation and in a NIAC. In East Timor, the structures of uh, law enforcement and the agents had completely dissolved. There was nothing. And it had to be reconstructed from scratch uh, at the start by Interfed and then by the UN Transitional Administration uh, prior to full East Timorese independence in May 2002. Now, to cover the gap, because there had to be something, um, Interfed uh, established a detainee monitoring unit, uh, which comprised an independent military judge, a prosecutor, who is actually one of them is here, my, my comrade uh, Ian Henderson was a prosecutor on that, uh, a council for detainees and a, and a detention visitor. Now, the DMU was, not a, was, was about uh, review of ongoing detention, not about trying offences. So it's about whether to keep people incarcerated, awaiting the reconstruction of a justice system to then deal with the actual criminal offence. Now, there, I reckon there were five bedrock principles that covered detention in East Timor, a less than NIAC law enforcement situation. The first was we had to ensure a process that allowed for quick initial removal from the streets of people who were a security and stability threat. The second is we had to ensure application of the relevant human rights. The third is we had to use the local criminal law as the general background, although there is still this subset for security detention when you're doing a stability operation. The fourth was we used elements of LOAC on a policy basis to inform the design of the system. And the fifth was we needed to have in place a system of fundamental guarantees for human rights and treatment post the handover, uh, post the handover uh, into the criminal justice system. Now, my point about the fact that there's actually very little difference, in my view, between what took place in East Timor and what takes place in Afghanistan, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, is because those same five bedrock principles actually govern the way detention's done in Afghanistan, a NIAC in which we are definitely a belligerent. So in Afghanistan, when Australia redeployed in 2005, we went into a Ruzgan province as a partner with the Dutch. And part of the uh, partnership arrangement was that when Australia took detainees, we handed them over to the Dutch who ran the detention system, and they took legal responsibility for our detainees and then handed them into uh, the Afghan system after the 72 hours in accordance with ISAF procedures. So effectively, we had an MOU, a, a memorandum of understanding with the Dutch, who gave us all the guarantees we needed, and we gave them the guarantees they needed, 
But then the MOU was with between the Dutch and the Afghans for the actual on forwarding, the on handover. Now, when the Dutch left uh, Aruzgan in, in August uh, last year, Australia had to develop a, a detention system from go to woe, so from detention to handover into Afghanistan. And the way that was done was negotiating an MOU with Afghanistan and another MOU with uh, the US. But the key point here is that it's the same five bedrock principles. There was really no distinction drawn, I can't see a great distinction at any rate, between the way we did detention in East Timor and the way it's done, and I'm talking principles, bedrock principles, uh, in Afghanistan. When you take the first one, ensuring that the process allows for quick initial removal from the battle space, as opposed to the streets, of those posing security or stability risks. This is still the underpinning requirement. The second, ensure application of the relevant human rights to detainees. This again has explicitly been said by the Minister of Defence to be the second priority. The third is you use local criminal law as the background with a subset for security detainees. This is still the case. We don't hold, unless we've got the evidence, the prosecution pact to hand across, except in a small limited case where you're talking about security detainees. The fourth, and this is the most contentious one, I think, is that you use elements of LOAC on a policy basis to inform detention operations. Now, this is interesting. I'll read you an excerpt from what the Minister of Defence recently said. He said, the detainee management framework draws on applicable international standards and advice from international organisations. It is consistent with, that is not based in, it is consistent with the laws of armed conflict and the Geneva Conventions. And that's a point we might return to in discussion because I think it's a, a perhaps a talisman or an indicator of where the law of detention, including in NIAC, is, is perhaps going. And then finally, having in place a system of fundamental guarantees so that you can uh, ensure that post handover that um, the appropriate human rights are, are um, dealt with. And this is dealt with just about every country who is in ISAF through a monitoring process post handover. So to wrap up, I think the Australian experience, which I've tried to, to bring out through comparing a, a high-end non-NIAC law enforcement operation with a NIAC operation where we are a belligerent, I think it clearly illustrates that it's not only legitimate, but it's actually required to bring to bear legal and policy, legal policy considerations, not just the purest view of the law, but to bring legal and policy considerations to bear when you're dealing with a conflict characterisation decision. Now, this is potentially contentious, so I admit that, because a, a black letter purist will say, no, it's about the facts on the ground. The rationale, I think, is expressed in Pictet's commentary quite well, and he says, a wounded soldier is not, deserving, is not more deserving or less deserving of medical treatment according to whether his government does or does not recognise the existence of a state of war. And there's a lot of humanitarian common sense in that. But I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case when you're dealing with NIAC, that is the lower thresholds of where LOAC kicks in. And that's because I think, fundamentally, the admonition to facts, the purest admonition to facts, is really a call to an objective test in many ways. Now, when you're dealing with the, the, the line between IAC and NIAC, or really the line as to whether there's an IAC at all, a lot of the objective facts are really quite visible. There's two clashing forces in uniform. But the jurisdictional facts that inhabit that grey area when you're deciding whether it's a law enforcement operation or whether it's crossed the threshold into a NIAC are much greyer. They're much more fluid and they're much more discretion built into the terminology because there we're talking about violence, we're talking about deciding what is banditry uh, and, those, and terrorism. And so there's a great deal more flexibility and greyness in that decision-making space. And I think I'd just like to conclude with something that Geoffrey Best wrote in his uh, book, Law and War. And he observes of this conundrum uh, for the negotiators of the Geneva Conventions, he says, they had known what an international war was, but how are they to know what an interna a non-international armed conflict when they saw one? How are they to tell it from mob violence, riots and banditry? These were not silly or necessarily non-humanitarian questions, and I would submit they are still very much live questions today. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Well, uh, we will now open it up for, uh, for questions. Uh, we have plenty of time, so uh, please uh, be done. Uh, See if I can, uh, everybody can hear me at uh, holding this thing uh, right. But I'm uh, John Murphy from uh, Villanova University Law School. Uh, it's been a very interesting panel. 
Thank you all for uh, your uh, presentations. My basic question is, uh, is whether uh, the rules of, uh, that apply uh, to uh, NIAC in any way created difficulties. Well, obviously in the case of Australia, with your unusual circumstances in East Timor, they created major difficulties in carrying out your missions. But I'm wondering perhaps particularly in the case of uh, both the Philippines uh, and uh, Colombia, uh, whether your uh, dealing uh, with uh, your insurgencies, whether the NIAC uh, rules uh, really were helpful or uh, created obstacles or something in between. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, definitely, uh, we have a problem in uh, uh, complying to the rules of the NIAC in our, uh, in the context of the Philippine scenario. One, for example, the communist groups, they don't wear, they don't wear a distinct uniform. Most of the time they are in civilian, in civilian clothes. They don't have a distinct weapon, so practically they use the same guns that we have. In fact, most of their guns uh, come from us after they ambush our troops or they raid a, an armory or a, a detachment. Uh, one thing good for the communist groups, they establish their uh, camps, like logistics camps or training camps, outside population areas. But the disadvantage is uh, they move around in small groups. They literally stay in civilian communities. They work with them, pray, uh, eat with them. Uh, you know, uh, they do propaganda works. So there are times that our patrols catch up with them inside small communities. And when there's an encounter, an engagement, there are some civilian casualties. On the side of the <clears throat> MILF, uh, our main problem there is uh, they, they do have some uniform to project that they are really a, you know, a belligerent uh, group, but that's for picture taking only. On the ground, again, they were civilians. They are actually farmers with a gun on the back you know, when they are on their uh, farmland. For, during the ceasefire, we, we have no problem, but when ceasefire, when ceasefire breaks down, when we attack an MILF camp, practically we are attacking a community. They call it MILF camp, but their families are with them. Children, their wives, they're with them. So when you attack an MILF camp, uh, somehow there will be civilian, uh, maybe we can minimize the casualties, but there will be big civilian displacements. And the part of the culture of the Muslim is when they build their houses, there will always be a mosque right in, in the middle of this uh, you know, community. Even if there's only 10 houses, they will somehow build a mosque. And there will always be a civilian object when you're attacking it. So again, we are not a very modern army. We don't have precision gui guided munitions. So sometimes we get into trouble because our Air Force sometimes you know, hit the target and they're 500 meters off. You know? and sometimes we accidentally hit some civilian objects. These are the challenges we face. There is really an effort uh, to modernize. The U.S. is also helping, helping us to you know, acquire better weapons, uh, providing us also some support, uh, especially on uh, counterterrorism. But uh, it's really very hard. Uh, what we, uh, on the, that's for the dis uh, principle of, of distinction. But on the proportionality, more or less, we came up with the rules, rules of engagement because since we have purely conventional weapons or, and uh, World War II you know, in, uh, weapons inherited from the US, like uh, we still have the 105 howitzer. And, uh, I think a few countries use the 105 now. Most of the armies use 155 millimeters. Uh, we, in, for the NPA uh, environment, we generally, we do not allow the use of artillery. There's no need because the NPA groups are operating in a, in a group of five to 10 at any one time. Unless they will attack a detachment, they will uh, uh, concentrate their forces maybe into a group of three, 30 to 100. And so 
it depends on the situation. But generally, we don't allow the use of artillery because uh, when our troops get engaged, uh, I think the, their uh, individual weapons will be enough. And uh, there's a level of authority to, in, even in cases with the MILF, there's a level of authority where the artillery could be fired with the authority from at least the brigade commander. Uh, it, is, it is the authority of the brigade commander to, if there's a call for fire, then he gives the go signal to use the artillery. But for the aircraft, for the bombing runs, it is the area commander, my level, to, uh, to give the authority to, to uh, uh, dispatch uh, aircraft to drop a bomb or rockets. So that's how, we, so that's how we do it. And then basically our basic rule is if you use the artillery and mortar, indirect fire weapons, there must be a ground observer, a forward air controller or a forward observer. There were some instances that commanders fired their artillery, artillery based on you know, A1 intelligence information and they hit some civilians. So we see to it that uh, nobody will fire indirect weapons without any actual observer on the ground. So these are some of the innovations we, we make in order to, to address the, the limitations and the proportionality principle where you cannot just use indirect weapons without any actual observer. So that's how we manage our conflict there. Okay, I want to make some points about this very interesting question. So I think that when we understand, when we start to apply international humanitarian law in our internal conflict, we realize that through this law, we could increase our combat capability, <clears throat> especially in the case of the Air Force. So we had a, a problem in 1998 in a military operation where one of our helicopters bombed someplace. <coughs> Excuse me. And 18 people were killed in this, in this case. And we, at the beginning, Somebody said that this 18 people killed, among them six, six children, were because the helicopter bombed them. So we went to the place, when I, when I say we, the, the, the Air Force commander sent a, a team to see in the place what happened. And what we realized was that we didn't did that. So it was a mistake from the FARC who had a car bomb and because a mistake that car exploded and killed these people. That was the, 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 the outcome of this investigation. So we leave the place, we led that investigation to the civilian court, but after two years we, we got a, a, how do you call this? So a university from the United States were there and they organized like a, a judge, a, a trial, excuse me, a trial. And, and in this trial, they came to the decision that who caused this kill, this killing was the Air Force. So because that case, we had to start putting attention of all the things that, that happened in war. So the Colombian Air Force, after that in 1998, changed the doctrine and we are bombing almost every day. And we don't have one pilot in jail. So in this case, especially in this case, help us a lot to understand that we have to know the law and to apply the law. Second, 
talking about the enemy. So we know that they do not apply the law. So that's something that we know for sure. So we don't care about them in this sense. What we do is, if we know them because the intelligence, what we do is put this information in justice, and if we capture them, we send them to justice, to trial, and that's why we got too many of them killed or in jail. And many of them are here in the United States because they are involved in narco trafficking, so they were extradited. There is something that, that happened, and, and it's very difficult for me to explain to, to the, 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 the military members, and is what happened with the policy of the government during the last period. And I say that the security policy is victim of its own success because we got a very liberal constitution. So we got a very nice constitution in the sense of rights. So now people in Colombia think that they can act, they can complain without the risk of being killed. So in that sense, it's harder for us as a military forces or as a police to fulfill our mission because we got more restrictions. If at this moment we ask for a terrorist status, it is almost impossible to get it because they say, okay, if we had a huge problem 10 years ago and we didn't use an special anti-terrorist statute, why today, if the condition is better, we can have a special statute to deal with this problem? So to summarize, I think that no, rules are not a problem. We know that it is not easy to deal with the, the problems that we have, with the rules that we have, but it's the only way to deal with the problem. I, I think from my perspective, and again, I emphasize I'm, I'm just me, not, a, not speaking for the government or anything like that. Um, I, I think that NIAC in particular is the place where this uh, beauty contest is being played out, and that is that LOAC as a whole is subject to two things at the moment. It's subject to a, a uh, program to humanise it, and it's subject to a program to harmonise it. And NIAC LOAC is where this is being played out, I think, in its, in its most extreme form. So at one end, you've got the drive to, sorry, you've got the drive to harmonise. And I think that where we see that is the attack rules. So for many states operating in Afghanistan, for example, even though it's a NIAC, by default, they'll refer to AP1, or the states that are AP1 signatories, will refer to AP1, which is an IAC, an IAC set of targeting rules, as the default to use in a NIAC. So in one way, we're seeing NIAC squeezed because of the harmonisation project. At the other end, and I think the tension is the representative here, you're seeing NIAC squeezed by the um, by the humanised project in, in that detention is being more and more infused with the, the human rights or the law enforcement paradigm, the sensibilities that go with that paradigm. And so to me, NIAC is the actual bit of LOAC that is most at threat of almost diminishing. It's at the diminishing point of the diminishing point of the diminishing point. Darren? Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, Colonel Darren Stewart, uh, International Institute of Humanitarian Law. Uh, I, my question is actually directed um, squarely at Rob, um, and uh, I have some difficulties with the the issue of the Australian government's categorisation of East Timor as a non, uh, in non, in, uh, as a not a not in. Sorry, let me get the words right. Not a non-international armed conflict. Uh, and that, in fact, it was a law enforcement um, activity. 
And I think it demonstrates a bit of muddled thought, frankly, on behalf of the Australian government, and opacity of the same level, perhaps if not more worse, than that, that you were referring to the UN um, about. And the reason for that is, I think the overriding objective the Australian government had was to not upset the Indonesians and to, to keep friendly with them. Uh, I don't believe that the uh, invitation by the Indonesian government has any relevance in terms of determining whether it's a NIAC or not a NIAC, uh, actually. Uh, and I think you do have to look at the facts situation on the ground to determine whether it is a, a non-international armed conflict. And as such, I think the United Nations Security Council resolution uh, under Chapter 7 supports the, uh, a conclusion you could draw that it, in fact, was a non-international armed conflict, even though that was an inconvenient conclusion that the Australian government could have come to, resulting in a categorization of the conflict in that form. And I'd also ask, um, perhaps in, so, in so those circumstances, um, why then the Australian troops' force posture when they arrived in East Timor suggested more of a, a NIAC at the higher end than a law enforcement activity, which um, you said that they were engaged in, and indeed the government took that decision. We also have reference from David Kilcullen um, in his book on counterinsurgency, where he refers to firefights between the Australian troops and Indonesian troops, uh, as well as the militias within East Timor. Uh, again, further evidence, I think, that suggests that it isn't a law enforcement activity, and more of a non-international armed conflict. Uh, and in that sense, is it the case that the Australian position, and I know you don't speak on behalf of Australia, but certainly you're a shaper in terms of opinion, is it the case that there's a rejection of the concept, concept of non-international armed conflict as existing across a continuum where you may have armed conflict of a non-international nature, which is uh, more um, in terms of dealing with the levels of force, which is more of a law enforcement uh, human rights paradigm, i.e. the lower end of a NIAC, as opposed to those like Afghanistan, who also invited in all of the ISAF forces, uh, requires a more robust um, use of force uh, paradigm being applied. And it just troubles me that, uh, that there seems to be this unnecessary confusion um, for soldiers on the ground that come out of the fact that you're, you're talking about a specific law enforcement paradigm. And, to con and I think the confusion comes by then looking at rules of engagement and trying to take rules of engagement and re-engineer a categorization based from the rules of engagement. It strikes me that's entirely uh, bottom about face, uh, shall we say, in terms of the where you should be approaching the, the, the question from. Uh, and then as a supplementary to that, can I ask where you see a security detention authority arising if you're saying it is not a non-international armed conflict and you're there under the invitation of the Indonesians and you're not necessarily applying Indonesian criminal law. Where, where does that authority come from? Okay, thanks for that. You bastard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, a couple of, of, of quick ones first, um, and if I didn't make myself clear, I apologise, and I'll do so now. No, certainly the ROE followed from the categorisation, as opposed to uh, re-engineering the categorisation from the base of the ROE. Uh, certainly the ROE followed from the categorisation. Um, and for security detention, uh, the authorisation is the Security Council resolution. So it does indeed, for us at any rate, we would say, if the Security Council resolution involves uh, main, main, uh, uh, Restoring and maintaining security, that gives you some scope for a security detention process uh, parallel to, often the same process in many ways, parallel to the criminal detention process, which of course is your main, your main aim when you're trying to restore uh, law and order. Now, on to the, the other, one, the other uh, sort of more substantive ones. First of all, uh, you're quite right. In fact, the ICRC view at the time was that there was an armed conflict. Um, and the basis of that uh, well, certainly, as, as, as I understand, Australia understood it. The base of that was that if Australian troops and militia got into um, a firefight, that effectively, because the militia was controlled and uh, controlled by elements of the Indonesian armed forces, this made it de facto a, an armed conflict and therefore would have to be governed by the, the rules of, of, um, of LOAC. But the Australian view and the UN view, the Security Council specifically took that view, was that no, any, if, if that occurred, essentially we'd be looking at a, 
uh, a self-defense self scenario. So patrolling along a street in Dili, someone picks up a weapon and starts taking pot shots at the patrol, they respond in self-defense. You may, in fact, I think it was, um, who made the point yesterday? It might have been Charles actually made the point that in some ways, when it comes to pulling the, the trigger or the, the ultimate consequence, as long as the troops are well trained, whether it was a LOAC rule that authorised it or a self-defence rule, it's probably probably going to achieve the same outcome. However, you are quite right in that there's a very steep educational uh, and training impost that comes with this decision. Um, the Indonesian invite, I think, is an interesting one. The way to, to look at it, I think, is as opposed to Afghanistan, where we have an invitation from the government of Afghanistan to help to fight on behalf of or with the government of Afghanistan against an insurgency, in Indonesia the problem was the enemy, if there had been an armed conflict, we'd be invited in by Indonesia as well as a Security Council Chapter 7 resolution. But the enemy, if we had decided there was an armed conflict, were actually Indonesian supported militia. So that made the you're going in on the invitation of the previous colonial power, if we call them that, to fight groups that they're sponsoring. So that, that was the, the complicating issue with the invitation, I think. Um, force posture, absolutely. Um, they went in uh, in a very a heightened force uh, posture. Still a law enforcement force posture, but a heightened law force posture, simply because of the uncertainty. It all happened very quickly, we weren't quite sure. And I have to say, pot calling kettle black, um, Northern Ireland, that's all I'll say. <laughs> And um, two final points that you brought up. The first is, I think the, the Australian view is that we can actually be involved in NIACs, but not a belligerent. So we can be on the ground where there's a NIAC going on around us, but not be a belligerent to it, and therefore operating under a law enforcement stabilisation paradigm, as opposed to using the LOAC. And I think that's not an uncommon thing for Australia, and I think other states do the same. Uh, so you, you're an intervener, you're not in there on any given side, you're not a belligerent, but clearly there's a night going on around you and you, know, uh, you enforce in, um, in Bosnia, for example, face this on a daily basis, I would think. And finally, the UN Security Council Chapter 7 Resolution. Yeah, it's an interesting one. A and my conclusions in that view come from the fact that there are lots of UN Security Council Chapter 7 resolutions where it would be impossible to say there's any sort of armed conflict going on. So by definition, they can only be uh, law enforcement operations. And I, mean, th I think there have actually been many more of those than there have been Chapter 7 uh, All Necessary Means Resolutions that apply in, a, in an armed conflict scenario. Uh, yeah, piracy is a Chapter 7 resolution, there's, still, there's no conflict there. Um, uh, there are, um, when you do uh, certain interdiction operations, there's no armed conflict there. Interdiction in the North Arabian Gulf or the Northern Persian Gulf between uh, 1991 and 2003, Chapter 7 operation, all necessary means, no armed conflict. And so I think that's actually uh, a routine thing, certainly I think from the Australian point of view, it's routine to be involved in a Chapter 7 all necessary means operation, even if there's an armed conflict going on around you, but not to be authorised to use the armed conflict rules because we're not a belligerent. Uh, thanks, I'm Dan Saxon. Uh, this question is for Rob again. Rob. You spoke about the efforts to um, merge uh, compliance with LOAC and um, uh, rules of engagement amongst the multi members of the multinational force in Afghanistan. But you didn't say very much about Afghan government forces. And I'm not an expert on Afghanistan and I've never been deployed there, but from what I've read, uh, uh, to say the least, the Afghan state is fairly fragmented. There is a tribal culture there. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about efforts to try to uh, uh, ensure that Afghan government forces comply with LOAC, comply with standard um, ROEs, and how successful those efforts may have been. Um, I'll say up front that there are people in this audience who will be much better qualified to, to, to speak on that. But I think there's two, there are two dimensions to that. The first is that there is, a, there is an actual concrete training program. Someone actually has responsibility for, for this rule of law and uh, a subset of that is for training and, and development in the um, law of armed conflict area uh, and in, particularly in developing uh, rules of engagement type issues. Uh, 
The second mechanism, and I think the more important mechanism where this happens is mentoring. This is a relatively new idea in a lot of these uh, situations in that when you mentor, uh, for example, Australian forces mentor a, a Kandak a, a battalion in, um, in a Ruzgan province, or se several of them, but the way that's done is you actually put your trainers, your mentors, embedded with the forces, the Afghan forces, and they go out and they do the operations with the Afghan forces. And so, in a way, because they're there partnered with the Afghan forces, it's a bit of a teaching by doing approach in many ways. And so, whilst you might not have a formalised LOAC training program, the way it's done is just, it's just inherent. It's uh, within the process of mentoring as a whole. So every day when you do OK, here's the operation, here's our planning, and we go over, we develop rules of engagement, that sort of thing. And so in a way, it's just part of the fabric of being in a mentoring role. I hope that sort of explains it. Colonel Duchenne, my question goes for the first one for Rob. Um, Rob, you've spoken about two legal frameworks. It'd be either self-defense or LOWAC. Uh, and in your case, you refer to NIAC. And you also said something about the rules of engagement on mission accomplishment and, and force protection. And I'm a bit curious where you would, uh, where you would bring that d down in this, uh, in this double framework uh, system. W looking at mission accomplishment, that would go beyond self-defense or regular self-defense, I would say. That's also something like extended self-defense and so on. So where would that go? Where would that fit in into this legal framework? Um, and then a question for Colonel Gomez. Uh, I liked your red and blue soldiers card. And I, I, I was wondering, at what point in time would you switch from one color to the other? Would that be uh, done on a daily basis or would that be part of the decision making process? Uh, could you elaborate on that a bit, please? Thank you. I think when you're dealing with the issue of whether it's a, if it's a law enforcement operation or it's a, a NIAC at the lower level or just a NIAC full stop, to me the place where you find that set out is in the mission accomplishment rule. So uh, in Australia, Australian ROE, for example, always has rules on self-defence, regardless of the type of operation. And in the rules on self-defence it'll always say something along the lines of uh, use of force up to and including lethal force in self-defence, unit self-defence, uh, is permitted. Now that'll apply whether it's a law enforcement operation or whether it's a LOAC based operation. That, that exists and it's independent of the LOAC issue. That's all governed by Australian criminal law, that issue. Where a soldier answers for a self-defence claim is in Australian courts. However, it's the mission accomplishment rule where the distinction is drawn. And the way it, you will draw, I think, it, between a law enforcement operation and a LOAC based operation is the mission accomplishment rule will say you can use force up to, but not including lethal force for mission accomplishment. And that's a law enforcement based operation. So it's saying you can use force to achieve the mission. You can go and throw rioters to the ground and put them in plastic cuffs and ship them off to detention. You can break down doors. Uh, you can do all of these sorts of things, which is use of force, clearly, use of force, not in self-defense. That's got nothing to do with self-defense. That is use of force for a law enforcement purpose. You can do that as long as you don't use lethal force because your use of lethal force is, permit is only for self-defense. Whereas in a a LOAC based situation, your, your mission accomplishment rule will say you can use force up to and including lethal force in mission accomplishment. And what that's giving, giving you is further on down the line when you get into your attack rules and all that sort of thing, it says, yep, you can use lethal force in the prosecution of the attack. And that's the reference back. So to me, the, the way, if I'm reading a set of ROE, the way I distinguish whether the drafters have, just, if it's not evident, the way I work out whether the drafters are adopting a law enforcement or a LOAC based approach is that rule. If I read that rule and it says use of lethal force in mission accomplishment, it's got to be LOAC. There's no other explanation, for me anyway. There's no other explanation than it's a LOAC based operation. Okay, talking about, uh, about the red and the blue card. So not it is not a battlefield decision, so it is a battalion decision. So the commander of the battalion based on the intelligence information that he has, so he make the decision before deploy the, the, the group of soldiers. And, and also, there, there is a discussion right now in Colombia about this set of rules of engagement. And 
it has to do with a decision by the government. So as I told you, we got the FARC, the ELN, but also we got that we call the new criminal bands. So, and the government decision was that we treat them with law enforcement. So with the blue card. And, and, and the ICRC is saying that two of these criminal organizations reach the requirements to use international humanitarian law because they say that this organization create certain level of violence, they got a line of command, and they also got certain territory control. And even though this concept from ICRC, the government decision is not to use lethal force against this criminal organization. So, so yes, not when the commander in the terrain make the decision to use the blue or red, no, that is not the case. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Colonel Gomez, I think you're the only one I haven't met this morning. This is uh, Ken Watkin and the Stockton uh, professor here. The, um, it, it's uh, one question for all three, but, but the, the uh, slightly different experiences, so I think it in, I'll sort of address it generally and then each of you with the, the facts. Fascinating discussion this morning of where categorization runs into the complexity of the operational situation where you are. And so I guess in the sense of trying to categorize it as a NIAC or law enforcement, I wonder if you could comment on how, whether that at some point becomes artificial or not in terms of what you're meeting on the ground. So for Lieutenant General Ferrer, when you're, you've talked about the Abuseyev group as a criminal group, but there seems to be this cross-pollination back and forth between, between groups. And how does that affect the assessment of the troops as to whether they are using elevated levels of force or whether they're doing uh, criminal law enforcement. For Colonel Gomez, you've gone to a two-card system, and the question is, in the context of using the red card, um, what happens if you run into people who are civilians who may be using force who are not part of the armed group? And so is there a, is there a notion of a fallback to the blue card, or is there a danger of running down a tunnel in terms of the, the complexity of what you're dealing with? I guess for Rob McLaughlin, a similar sort of thing, uh, whether it's chapter six or chapter seven or all necessary means, how do you assess in terms of the authority to use for force against the 1999 Secretary General's bulletin, which indicates on even in chapter six, use of force and self-defense in combat, IHL applies, and would certainly apply in chapter seven, and how that affects the notion of this categorization. Okay, so, so taking into account that if, for instance, we get soldiers in the terrain with the red car, so there is a, a government policy and also a Ministry of Defense and the, the commander of the military forces policy that says that, yes, if you are using red car, you can you can use lethal force as a first action. But if you can capture, demobilize, that is better. And because all the cases that we get against some members of the military forces, so especially in, in the last years, I think that that we are taking that very seriously. So we know that, that even though we could be in a international humanitarian law environment, if we can avoid 
the use of lethal force, we will avoid it because of the consequences. In, in the case of the Air Force, is different in the sense that when we make the decision to bomb, is because it has passed to a long process. And, and we got some figures, and, and that is that from 10 eventually military objectives that we have, we only attack four. And the reason why we go to these numbers is because the risk that we have to face in the legal sense because we know the consequences. The, the story that I told you before about the, the case in, in 1998, this was a, an helicopter and the, and the pilot and the co-pilot today are facing a criminal investigation and they were condemned to 30, 30 years in jail. So, so we know the consequences. So, so we know what means to apply international humanitarian law inside our country. Okay, on, on, in the Philippine context, um, in, in as far as uh, counterterrorism is concerned, uh, generally we apply law enforcement operations. But how do we do it? We have a different setup now with Colombia. In Colombia, he said that uh, they now have uh, the the police is under the Defense Department. We had that setup uh, before 1991. We had the Philippine Constabulary and. Under its supervision is the Integrated National Police or the local police. And all of this is under the Department of Defense. But in 19, 1991, we separated the police under a national police law. The police now is under the Department of the Interior and Local Government, while the AFP, which is the Air Force and the Navy and the Army, is now under the Defense Department. But we are still engaged in internal security. Now, uh, <clears throat> On the, the Abu Sayyaf, whenever they do kidnapping, we ask the victim to file cases. We file cases, you know, from the the leader, the, the sub leader or leader, and all his members, so that when it's time to arrest him, we have some warrant to do it. Now, uh, general rule: maybe when the Abu Sayyaf member goes down to the town, maybe as uh, one or two person, the police can lead the arrest. But when they are in the mountains, the armed forces lead the combat operations because they are heavily armed. Police operations will not work. But uh, we see to it when we arrest, we, we expect that there'll be resistance. So when we do arrest, even if there's only two policemen, we, we provide you know, the muscle, we call it, we provide the muscle. We provide one platoon of army to support the police just to ensure that there is always a policeman. And so it is law enforcement operations. Even against what we call the rogue MILF. There are some MILF members who moonlights as kidnappers, you know, uh, extortionists, and so. What we do is we file cases. We ask the police to file cases against them. And then when we operate against them so that we will not be via accused of ceasefire violation, we see to it that it is the police that will lead the operation. So we, the relationship will be, uh, there's a lead agency. If, uh, if we think the police can do it, they lead the operations. We back them up. We support them with uh, soldiers. And then uh, if it's in the mountain areas, we do rescue operations, for example, of a kidnapped victim. And we think uh, the police cannot do it. We lead the operations as long as after the for example, after the engagement, we see to, see, to, we see to it that the police will do the, you know, the, the crime scene investigation so that we, will, we can pro also protect ourselves, ourselves from human rights you know, accusations, or sorry, human rights violation accusations. So I guess two, two, two components to the question. Artificiality. I actually don't see it as artificiality. I actually see it as the inbuilt flexibility at the lower threshold. 
I think that there's very little flexibility at the upper threshold when you're deciding if it's an IAC or between a NIAC and an IAC, although this issue of internationalised internal armed conflict, I think, complicates that threshold. But at that lower threshold, I think actually, it, quite rightly, it has a great deal of inbuilt flexibility. So I think it's not so much artificiality as, as flexibility just by the nature of when you're trying to decide whether it's, when you're dealing with all those messy things that are, whether it's a, a, a NIAC or a, or a law enforcement operation, that, that flexibility is necessary. As the UN Secretary General General's bulletin, um, unfortunately, sir, you've just mounted me up on my hobby horse. I actually don't know what it means. I have no idea what the 99 SG's bulletin means. Um, if it's saying that for a troop contributing nation with no great uh, feel for ROE uh, or no great training program in IHL or human rights, if it's saying that, guys, when you send troops in to a UN operation, because you really haven't got much else, I want you to use GC4 as your ideas, you know, your something, so you've got something to do detention against, for example. If that's what it's saying, okay, yes, I can see that it, it serves some purpose. But if it's saying that uh, you should use the targeting rules in LOAC whenever you're on the ground, that I, disagree, I just think is wrong legally. I think it's unlawful. And so I've never fully understood exactly what the UN Secretary General's bulletin is getting at. If it is just trying to bring across general principles where it's not the sharp end of LOAC, not the use of force bits, the killing and destroying rules, yes, I can see there's a purpose there. But if it's trying to say that the killing and destroying rules apply whenever the UN sends you somewhere, I absolutely reject that. I think that is just not right. Can, can I add something? Excuse me. I, I got an, an example that about the difficulty to, to try to apply these two different set of laws in, in, in a country like Colombia. There was a, a, a combat. <clears throat> One guerrilla member was injured, so the soldiers did correctly. So they called the, the, the commander, they told them, they told him that they got this guerrilla member injured. The commander sent the helicopter. They took the guerrilla member from the jungle to the hospital, and then they give him to, to the prosecutor, he present to the judge, and when they were trying to legalize the capture, the judge says that there were too many mistakes in the procedures, so he released the, the guerrilla member. So imagine the frustration of soldiers and the commander spending and using the helicopter and all these sources trying to save the life of this guy, and, and he was released. So it's, it's, it's very hard to try to apply both laws. Yeah, Jeff Korn, this is for Colonel Gomez. First off, I genuinely appreciate you highlighting for us the challenge of operating in an environment where the armed forces are called upon to perform both a constabulary role and an armed conflict role, and especially the perspective of somebody who's flown combat missions and also been a legal advisor for, for both sets of operations. But I want to focus on your red-blue card. It strikes me that the, the more significant of those two is the blue card. It seems to me that the red card is really not saying anything that the armed forces don't already know, which is if you're deployed on a mission to, to engage uh, FARC operatives or ENL operatives, uh, you're operating under an armed conflict paradigm, and that doesn't mean that you can just kill everybody. It means that when you identify a lawful object of attack, you're allowed to use deadly force for mission accomplishment, analogous to what um, uh, Dr. McLaughlin said. It's, but it strikes me that because you're in a situation where the armed forces are being increasingly called upon to perform law enforcement or constabulary functions against organized criminal groups that they might perceive as not operationally different from the FARC. In other words, if I'm a platoon leader or a company commander and I'm sent into Cartagena or Medellin to deal with this organized criminal gang that's highly armed and capable, from the perspective of the threat they present to me, I don't see them very, very differently than the threat that I confronted six months ago when I was conducting operations against the FARC. 
that, that the command itself is saying to them, you are now in an environment where we're telling you, no matter what it feels like on the ground, you're not allowed to slip into that mentality of you're fighting an armed belligerent enemy. You're in a law enforcement environment, period. So I'm curious if, if your perspective is that, that, that the significance for, the, for the, the soldiers executing the missions is more on the blue side than the red side. I mean, we, the, the, we have to remind them very categorically that when you're called upon to do this mission, you are not in an armed conflict and you cannot invoke that authority. And then the second part of the question is, how much of that do you think has been driven by the Fiscalia's approach to prosecuting members of the armed forces? How much of it is an effort of the Colombian Armed Forces leadership to protect their forces from the uh, investigations of the, of the public prosecutor who's gonna look more geographically, who's gonna look at operations outside of areas where we know there's a FARC presence and say, anytime you kill anybody in that situation, we're gonna be pretty aggressive in the way we investigate uh, those operations, and is it, a, is it an effort to protect yourselves from this pattern? Because I, I think that, I know I've heard uh, you speak on this before, and I know the first time I heard the statistics on the number of Colombian officers and service members who've been prosecuted for engaging in hostilities, I found it pretty surprising. And that's why I made that point yesterday that, you know, when we talk about the purported transparency between the law enforcement framework and the armed conflict framework from the point of view of pulling the trigger. I mean, if you're defending yourself, you're gonna pull the trigger. The outcome might be the same. There are second and third order consequences that are profoundly different. And I think Colonel Gomez, I appreciate the fact that you've highlighted some of that. So I'm curious how you, how you would react to those perceptions on the red blue card um, methodology that's being used in Colombia. Thank you very much for, for your question and, and your comments. So I think that you're right in the sense that not everybody is, is happy with this new set of rules, the, the, the red one and the blue one. But one of the reasons why we are using more the, the blue card instead the red one is because the success of the policy. So, so this is something that we can't deny. Second, I have to admit that there is a fear among the soldiers because all the cases that we have seen in the sense that there are many who are in, in jail right now because these mistakes or these problems. And, and the other thing is that we are changing our military doctrine. So, so I think that Clausewitz, Jomini, Van Krabber were very important in the 19th century, in the 20th century, but it is real that new threats, new wars are in the middle of population. So, so it is very difficult now to see two different armies confronting each other. So, so that's something that we are changing in, in, in our schools. So, so they know that the, the enemy is not anymore the one that, that we had before. And, and the last point that I wanna make is, no, I, if I remember I will, I will <laughs> talk about that later, but okay, I will. Um, I just wanted to make a general comment and then address a question uh, to Colonel Gomez. Um, in listening to the various panels I, um, on non-international armed conflict in the 21st century, I uh, had the feeling that there were certain issues that um, hover in the background and 
may not have been addressed so frontally. Um, that is the uh, international aspects of non-international armed conflict uh, and changing perspectives on the matter, uh, changing perspectives to the protagonists um, in NIAX, uh, particularly as they relate to the issue of self-determination uh, and how that impacts on both the Jews at Bellum and uh, more subtly also on Jews in Bellow. And the attitudes of the um, so-called organized international community on the one hand uh, and neighboring states. And here, of course, it relates as well to Colombia particularly, uh, also on East Timor. Uh, what I believe has happened, I've written on that, my name, by the way, is Michla Pomerantz from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, I'm referring to a modern uh, resurrection of a just war doctrine, uh, and in a form that uh, can uh, and does sharpen the asymmetry of asymmetric warfare, uh, and often tilts against uh, existing governments and states. I, um, and, and also bifurcates the rights and obligations, uh, allocating rights sometimes to one side uh, and obligations to the other. So the, um, I, I pointed out uh, in private conversation to Mr. Chang, uh, who I think presented a very interesting uh, thesis regarding the rules of no neutrality uh, he mentioned the rules of neutrality uh, as they existed in classic international law, in which until there was a state of belligerency and both sides were viewed as equals, uh, the tilt was toward the state against which there was an insurgency or a rebellion. Uh, that has changed in the new, what I for, refer to as the new UN law, uh, of self-determination in which, depending on the attitude to the protagonists, we may have a reversal of roles in which there is more sympathy with the group that is rebelling uh, than to the existing government uh, or regime. Uh, and I think that one of the things that Mr. Chang wished to do, um, I don't know how successfully, uh, he's accomplishing it, but it was to equalize rights and obligations. And I think yesterday there was also a question addressed uh, on that matter in, in the context, uh, for example, uh, if, of our own uh, region in relation to uh, the detention and of, uh, uh, of uh, kidnapped, uh, a kidnapped soldier, as we all know. Um, now, I, on the question of Colombia, I would like to address a question to Mr. Gomez. Uh, I recall that when there was an attack on FARC, a, a major attack, the attitude of some neighboring states uh, was less than sympathetic to the Colombian venture. And I wonder whether you could uh, elaborate on that. Thank you. Talking ab about the last point, the, the attack that happened in 2008 in the border of Colombia, the south border, that was a, a military operation against the, one of the most important leaders of the FARC. And, and the problem was that the, the camp was one mile outside Colombia. So the military forces identified this military objective, but they went to the president and to told him about the camp, and he made a political decision to attack it. He said, okay, I will assume the political responsibility, go ahead. So we 
did the operation. We killed that person. With him were like 23 or 24 other members of the organization. Among them were one Mexican, one Chilean, and, and one from Ecuador. So, and, and that was a, a tremendous problem in, in, in the political arena, but the president assumed the, the consequence. And, and I was talking to, to some of the, the person here in, in this conference about something that, that happened <clears throat> uh, one month ago, maybe. And when, when we did that military operation, we had the opportunity to get from that place like five or six laptops. And we got a lot of information from, from the criminal organization there. And with that information, we give that information to the prosecutor and we found, I, I remember one case, it was a congressman who was working with the FARC and the Supreme Court one month ago said that this information is illegal so that we can't use this information to prosecute this congressman. So at this moment, we, we got a tremendous concern because we don't know what to do in, in the sense that, because they said that this operation in the military sense was a legitimate operation, but the information that we got in that operation was illegal. So I don't know how to interpret that, that situation. And, and, and I want to, to add something that, that happened with, just to show you how, how difficult this environment is. So with, when President Uribe got to, to the presidency in 2002, he started saying, he started denying the internal conflict. So he said, we are not in an internal conflict. We are facing a terrorist threat. So that was a concern for us in the military forces. So we talked to the Ministry of Defense and he talked to the president. And the president sent us the following message. He said, no, these are two different things. One is the political position in where are denied an internal conflict. I do not recognize them as an insurgent. They are terrorists, they are criminals, and I treat them like that. I will not give them any legitimacy. But if you need to fight them, international humanitarian law, use it. And so, and that exactly was what we did. In the case of the Air Force, we plan each operation using international humanitarian law, identifying the military objective, identifying the military necessity in all the principles that I already told you. We organize all the intelligence information in that format and something that, that we told to the, to the officers who were in, in charge of intelligence was, okay, intelligence is secret before the military operation, but after you perform the military operation, we have to release all this intelligence information because we will need it in a criminal process to defend our pilots, to defend our soldiers, and that is what we are doing. But as I told you, and with the last statement from the Supreme Court, I don't know what will happen in the short future. One last comment or question from our colleague from Pakistan. <clears throat> 
Uh, I'm Commander Mahmoud Gardezi from Pakistan. I'm from the JAG Department of Pakistan Navy. Uh, first of all, my great appreciation for NWC for conducting this wonderful event. And uh, then second comments about uh, that since taking advantage of this forum, uh, Pakistan is the worst affected country as far as the real terrorism is concerned. And almost we lost 36,000 civilians in this uh, terrorism wave and almost 6,000 soldiers and 2,000 officers including. So we are the big sufferer uh, as far as terrorism is concerned. So my request would be that in future, uh, you may please invite somebody expert from Pakistan as well so that they can give you their experience of their side and their expertise on it. And the second thing which I think uh, is a bit irking for me and uh, bothering me being a legal man uh, is the definition of terror and parameters we are setting for uh, terrorism. Yes, the heinous crime of 9-11, uh, nobody can deny it on earth. And I think every human being would love to hate Osama bin Laden, Taliban, and Al-Qaeda with no reservation. But at the same time, we have, I think, expanded it so much. And uh, in, the, in the words of Professor Garraway, if we do not define the things and we are fighting the unidentified uh, culprits, so it would be difficult. And in same is the vision of the Sun Tzu. If you don't know your enemy, you are not going to have the end state. So whatever we have heard this morning, these are most of these things are uh, basically internal issues sometimes. Uh, they do not have uh, a clear br uh, bright line. And there is a wafer thin line between terrorism and normal these extremist activities. But sometimes there is a bright line because it is out of some ethnicity or some internal issues. But because at that time we needed this global war on terror and we wanted to mobilize the international community. That was the wonderful thing we did. And no doubt that was the heinous crime and we did the right thing. But now time has come. We make a clear bifurcation between the freedom fighters, between the internal conflicts and ethnicity. Because if we would not do it, it would create a pressure cooker situation and those people would be siding and having an access with various groups like we are having organized groups now, pirates, terrorists, smugglers, gun runners. They all are gathering together if we as international community are gathering against terrorism. So uh, in the words of uh, Professor uh, Kohn, that we should not be suffering this willful uh, blindness. So we should come out very clearly telling what is the reality. Because if we were doing this, this pressure cooker situation would be leaving no way, and we would, would be in trouble. And my special appreciation for uh, uh, Professor Wolf, because I'm really impressed by his views, and he was a very clear idea of things. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that will wrap us up for this morning. Uh, we